it's amazing that anybody heads indoors. Um, but you'll be rewarded for coming outside of the beautiful air and sunshine. Um, today we have with us Ray Haberski, who's visiting us from, he's a professor um, at Marion University in Indianapolis, um, where he teaches the history of American thought. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Ray is a very prolific author and scholar. He runs a very important blog on intellectual history in the United States. He's also the author of four books. Um, it's only a movie, films and criticism in American culture. Freedom to Offend, How New York Remade Movie Culture. The Miracle Case, Film Censorship and the Supreme Court. And the book that he's going to give us a little piece of today, God and War, most recently published, American Civil Religion Since 1945. Um, but I should also mention that um, Ray and I have worked together on a project for the Academy of American Franciscan History, and our, as luck would have it, our two essays are going to be bound together in a volume, so I'm very happy to be standing next to Ray intellectually in that volume and, um, here tonight. I also want to say that Ray is a Yankees fan, um, and now an avid Corvallis bicyclist yeah. after his days here. So um, thank you for coming, and we'll look forward to your talk. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Amy. Uh, Amy was one of the people that made this possible. Um, Chris Nichols as well. I really appreciate uh, the invitation. And Courtney Campbell, I appreciate uh, you extending the invitation for this particular lecture. So, and thanks to the whole community. I mean, Corvallis is a beautiful place, and I, uh, I envy all of you. Indianapolis is a, is a place. And uh, <laughs> at times, it's, it can be quite beautiful, uh, I, but not a lot of the time. So, and I imagine it is here. It's really been a pleasure to see a new place. I've never been to Oregon before, so this is my first uh, stop in Oregon. And it's been a very nice one, so I appreciate it. So after hearing uh, Amy's introduction of me, you're probably wondering why I've gone into anything to do with God or war after writing books about movies. So uh, the books about movies were really a conduit to talk about public culture and public debate. And so that's what uh, I've tried to do in all the books, how we talk about serious issues that emerge out of um, very public incidences. Movies create certain controversies. Um, I was always fascinated by how people thought about them, the art, the commerce, were they things that were disposable, which they were for the first half of movie history. Uh, but that's what sort of led me to this. As I was looking at um, the combination, the intersection in public debate between religion and, and movies, um, of course, this also spilled into religion and politics, religion and war. And uh, after 9-11, not surprisingly, a lot of this stuff came up to many of us. And so that was really the wellspring for the book, was to try to think about how we debate the idea of, of the nation going to war. And the touchstone for all of this, for me, is Lincoln. And that's what the first half of, the, of my paper, my talk is tonight, it's about Lincoln and how he is a touchstone for some of this a tradition. The second half will be about how that tradition has been carried forward and challenged or shaped by other people. And uh, really since 1945, I focus on, on three particular people. Okay. I've written the, the talk so it can be heard, so I hope it, it does get that kind of job. Right. Okay. So on Veterans Day 2009, just prior to his first major address in the war in Afghanistan, President Barack Obama walked through Arlington National Cemetery. He did this as many Americans do each year to pay tribute to those who lost their lives in service to the nation. But of course, the president is not like most Americans. Obama's observance suggests that soldiers who fight and die for the nation hold symbolic power in an American cosmology. They represent not so much American freedom, but the ultimate sacrifice for a nation that has enshrined certain ideas. As two sociologists explain, what is really true in any community is what its members can agree is worth killing for or what they can be compelled to sacrifice their lives for. This is Obama, a few nights later, when in a nationally televised speech, he took full ownership of the war in Afghanistan. The president stood before an audience of cadets at West Point Military Academy and attempted to provide, as all presidents do, an answer to the existential question, why we fight. Addressing the cynicism that had crept into the public's perception of the American war in Afghanistan, Obama declared, I believe with every fiber of my being that we, as Americans, 
can still come together behind a common purpose. For our values are not simply written, uh, words written into parchment. They are a creed that calls us together, that has carried us through the darkest of storms as one nation, as one people. The strength of our values, he said, are the source, the moral source, of America's authority. We go forward with the confidence that right makes might. Often it's the reverse. We could analyze the exceptionalist rhetoric uh, reflected in Obama's remarks, but I would like us to consider a larger historical burden under which a president must operate, that in war the nation finds faith, but a faith in what? That's what this talk is generally about, that faith. Well, when Obama spoke to those cadets, he did not ask them to die for him or to kill for God, but to fight for their nation, or more precisely, a mythical understanding of their nation. It is in war that we most often find the secularization of the nation, when Americans seem most willing to set aside their differences and accept an American civil religion. While this is not a term used on Fox News or CNN, civil religion does have popular connotations. It is often associated with stock expressions such as God bless America, one nation under God, or America is a Christian nation. However, civil religion also has complexity. It suggests that a nation means more than the sum of its laws and that a, and that a people's collective historical experience can transcend its material existence. In short, civil religion describes a nation as an idea more than a place. And for that reason, it is also very dangerous. So no president grappled with the power and perils of civil religion better than Abraham Lincoln. And in Lincoln's experience, we find the origins and irony of modern American civil religion. No matter what you think of Spielberg's uh, recent film, Lincoln, the choice he made to bookend his story with the Gettysburg Address, right, shown here, and the second inaugural, to the, to the right of it, actually captures the irony of Lincoln's civil religion. It is that irony I wish to discuss with you this evening, for it created a significant intellectual tradition that I believe is among Lincoln's most important bequests to us. At Gettysburg, Lincoln dedicated a cemetery that would be the final resting place for thousands killed just a few months earlier. Of course, his Gettysburg Address remains among the most sacred statements about the nation made by any president at any time. But why? In his remarks, Lincoln proposed a lasting tribute to the men who had fallen there, that the only suitable testament to their collective sacrifice was to pledge, quote, increased devotion to that cause which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that the dead shall not have died in vain. In other words, the war was not an end in itself, but a means to endorse, as Lincoln said, a new birth of freedom. For President Lincoln, and by extension and tradition, for any president, the tragedy of war might be redeemed if Americans rededicated themselves to the founding promise of their nation. Yet Lincoln, had Lincoln, made a very dangerous offer. That in war, the nation might find redemption. In other words, would other wars, potentially all wars, be seen in similar terms as a chance for redemption? Practically speaking, the Civil War forced Lincoln to confront a paradox, that his nation, though seemingly blessed with great promise, was in danger of, in fact, committing suicide. Historian Mark Knoll contends the origins of this paradox lay in a grand alliance between the Christian Bible and Enlightenment rationalism. Americans believed, Knoll explains, that they could see clearly what the world was like, what God was like, what factors drove the world, who was responsible for events, and how the moral balance sheet should read. That confidence manifested not merely an intellectual consensus, but also a dangerous hubris. Noel writes, quote, it imparted a nearly fanatical force to the prosecution of war. Now we know uh, what the results of that fanaticism was. Mass violence and death on, on a scale never equaled on American soil. One might assume that such experience would sorely test American faith in the nation, rather than affirm it. In short, Americans should have found God in new ways, or failing that, perhaps rediscovered the Jeremiads of Puritan Jonathan Edwards. Neither happened. The war did indeed spark a theological crisis, but it wasn't over competing views of God, but over competing claims to God. 
The irony was that while both sides prayed to the same God, both sides also believed their causes were sanctified by that same God. Lincoln, the rationalist, recognized the obvious contradiction of that. While Lincoln, the believer, wrestled with ways to accept that the war would mean more than he could comprehend. In his meditation on the divine will, Lincoln contemplated how the will of God prevails. But nobody, neither side in the war, could know what that will was. After all, he said, God cannot be for and against the same thing at the same time. In his second inaugural address, Lincoln pushed his metaphysical considerations much farther by taking the extraordinary step of challenging the way Americans used God in a time of war. But he didn't do this by claiming he understood God's will, but rather by dwelling on precisely the opposite notion. Lincoln recognized that his fellow Americans existed within a thick culture of faith. Faith in God, faith in the nation, faith in their own abilities to comprehend their times. He understood, as historian Harry Stout has written, that in the blood and transformation of the war, a national religion was born. It was to this national religion, this American religion, that Lincoln posed a devastating question in his second inaugural. If we shall suppose that slavery is one of those offenses which, in the providence of God, must needs come, but which, having continued through his appointed time, he now wills to remove, and that he gives to both North and South this terrible war as the woe due to those by whom the offense came. Shall we discern therein any departure from those divine attributes which the believers in a living God always ascribe to him? Lincoln asked whether the Civil War, that the terrible scourge of war, the terrible carnage of war, had done anything to undermine the belief that God has any active role in the United States. In American thought, the mixing of religion and politics was not incidental, but vital to the start, prosecution, and interpretation of the war. What made Lincoln the finest theologian of American civil religion was the sense of irony. While an American civil religion might rally the nation to do better, to remember its better angels, that same civil religion could be deployed to justify violence as redemptive. Of course, Lincoln, ironically, had been guilty of both. And through his experience, he understood the paradox of counseling a nation that was steeped in faith and often swept away by the intoxicating hubris of civil religion. Lincoln's continuing relevance is this. He did not dismiss popular uh, reliance on biblical faith to comprehend American history because he knew that for the vast majority of Americans, faith in God might be the only way to comprehend war. Every war from the Civil War to our present conflicts has confirmed this insight. Yet Lincoln offered a way to navigate between, on the one hand, using God to make normative claims about the meaning of war, that Americans might makes it right. And, and on the other hand, using religion to commend or condemn the nation in absolute terms. For Lincoln, looking to God helped bring perspective to the way war had revealed the soul of his nation, while at the same time alerting him to the irony of that revelation. No matter what Americans might claim, God's will would and should remain a mystery. Now my take on Lincoln echoes the work of other historians, such as Harry Stout, Alan Gulzo, Mark Knoll, Stuart Winger. All these historians, and I imagine many non-historians, are curious about the religion of the 16th president. Apparently, many of us believe that his faith reveals something fundamental about the historical relationship between religion and American politics. However, what is of particular interest to me is the intellectual influence of Lincoln's ironic critique of American civil religion, the sort of trap that he was in. I find the clearest illustration of this tradition emerging in the wake of the Second World War, a period in which two important trends merged in American history, the rise of the United States as an undisputed global power and the realization that such power was based on weapons and warfare that threatened to end human history. The idea that America could use its considerable might for right came of age during that period. And while it is obvious that the US fought other wars between the Civil War and the end of World War II, it is the dawning of the Cold War 
that also revised the conundrum of American power. In other words, in the Cold War, Americans once again faced the prospect of committing suicide. So the period following World War II, while euphemistically called post-war, was anything but. And because the United States has been in an almost constant state of war, Lincoln's bequest has remained relevant if also contested. We can see how his critique of civil religion played out across three conflicts, the Cold War, the Vietnam War, and the War on Terror. And in the work of three religious intellectuals, Reinhold Niebuhr, Martin Luther King, and Stanley Hauerwas. These three interpreters of Lincoln's bequest emerged as signal figures of their period of war because their religious faith seemed especially well suited to critiquing the war-inspired civil religion in their times. Speaking of time, this is Reinhold Niebuhr. Niebuhr continues to stand out in studies of post-war American religious history, primarily because, as a scholar such as Andrew Bezovich has noted, Niebuhr was a prophet who warned that dreams born of a peculiar combination of arrogance, hypocrisy, and self-delusion pose a large, potentially mortal threat to the United States. Niebuhr forged his critical stance in the depths of the Great Depression and out of the ashes of the worst war in human history, World War II. He was a prolific writer, publishing in many mainstream journals, active in the Democratic Party, and founder of Christianity in Crisis, a journal that grew into an influential voice of what came to be called Christian realism. That term meant applying original sin to the political experience of people even if they happen to be progressive Americans. So while not hopelessly pessimistic about human nature, Niebuhr was also not optimistic right, in the age of American power. In one of his most searing insights, Niebuhr preached, the whole drama of human history is under the scrutiny of a divine judge who laughs at human pretensions without being hostile to human aspirations. While Niebuhr's books and essays continue to attract readers, the text that seems to be quoted and read the most, including by our, our current president, is the irony of American history. How many people have, have read this? Sometimes still used in classes. Niebuhr had originally entitled his manuscript, This Nation Under God, but changed it when his publisher informed him that a, another book with a similar title was under press. A divine intervention, indeed since the key contribution of Niebuhr's book was not that Americans prayed to God for redemption of their nation, but the irony of that act, an insight Niebuhr shared, obviously, with Lincoln. Niebuhr wrote Irony as a series of essays in the late 1940s. The book came out in 1952, just a few years before, in 1948, Time Magazine, as you had seen in the previous slide, had certified Niebuhr's prominence by putting him on its 25th anniversary issue. With the publication of his book, The Early Cold War, Niebuhr, the public intellectual, punctuated a historical coll uh, collision, much as Lincoln had done with his second inaugural. Niebuhr wondered whether his fellow Americans, who had only sporadically shown any kind of humility in the face of power, Chris knows this quite well in his work, might now recognize that there was nothing necessarily righteous about their emergence as a superpower. Like Lincoln, Niebuhr took seriously the impulse of Americans to turn to God as a way to understand and rationalize the American experience. Yet that turn toward God came with especially dire consequences. Niebuhr warned, if Americans fell victim, quote, to the perils of moral and spiritual complacency. In short, America's civil religion might seem necessary in the time of stress, but could still lead to moral disasters if left unchecked. So to avoid such moral pitfalls, Niebuhr advised, we might well consider the spiritual attainments of our greatest president during the Civil War. Lincoln's ability to traverse the tricky territory of national theology, Niebuhr thought, demonstrated, quote, his awareness of the element of pretense in the idealism of both sides was rooted in the confidence of an overarching providence whose purposes partly contradicted and yet were not irrelevant to the moral issues of the conflict. So in this way, Lincoln could condemn slavery as a moral abomination. Niebuhr would condemn communism in similar terms. But without sentencing those involved to an ultimate fate that he himself 
could, had no power or could not determine. Niebuhr thought that Lincoln's combination of moral resoluteness about the immediate issues with a religious awareness of another dimension of meaning and judgment must be regarded as almost a perfect model of the difficult but not impossible task of remaining loyal and responsible to the moral treasures of a free civilization on the one hand while having some religious vantage point over the struggle. All right, so here is a rub after that long quote. To Niebuhr, Lincoln could not avoid acknowledging the evil of slavery, but doing so did not erase the sins of the nation that had perpetuated that institution and waged a bloody war to destroy it. All had sinned, all were sins. For Niebuhr, the problem of American civil religion in the early Cold War was one of perspective. Could the nation find a way to look at itself critically enough to withstand the temptations of power? So Niebuhr admired Lincoln's critique of American civil religion in part because it came from within the nation itself. That was very much where Niebuhr placed himself. As a mainline Protestant, Niebuhr had a privileged place in the political religious axis in America and hoped his warnings about hubris might influence those in power. Of course, you look back on the publication of irony with some irony itself, knowing that Niebuhr issued his warnings a decade before the United States would indeed squander its moral treasures of a free civilization in the jungles of Vietnam. And while American political leaders took little note of Niebuhr, a pivotal religious leader did. In the middle of the Vietnam War, Martin Luther King thundered about the irony of the American experience in Vietnam. Many are probably aware of King's debt to Niebuhr, that the prophet of the early Cold War reminded the prophet of the Vietnam War to be skeptical of the power of progressive institutions. This particular sort of optimism, King wrote, has been discredited by the brutal logic of events. Instead of assured progress in wisdom and decency, man faces the ever-present possibility of swift relapse, not merely into animalism, but into such calculated cruelty as no other animal can practice. Niebuhr reminds us of this at every hand. All right, so if Niebuhr's Lincolnian text is irony, King's is a speech that he gave on April 4th, 1967, at Riverside Church in Manhattan. The date is ominous, of course, as many of you probably know, for it came exactly one year before his death. As the undisputed prophetic voice of his generation, it is fair to say the king delivered a Jeremiah against the war. 3,000 people filled the great sacred space and rose to applaud King as he prepared to give his address. In his baritone voice, King began, I come to this magnificent house of worship tonight because my conscience leaves me no other choice. Echoing other liberal church leaders, King declared, A time comes when silence is betrayal. That time has come for us in relation to Vietnam. King understood the paradox the war had created for the United States and addressed it directly. I come to this platform tonight to make a passionate plea to my beloved nation. This speech is not addressed to Hanoi or to the National Liberation Front. It is not addressed to China or to Russia tonight. Tonight, King declared, I wish to speak to my fellow Americans who with me bear the responsibility for ending this conflict that has exacted a heavy price on both continents. He reminded his audience that in 1957, when he helped form the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the motto that that group had chosen was to save the soul of America. The moral dilemma of Vietnam threatened to draw men and skills and money like some demonical, destructive suction tube, he said, away from all the work yet to be done in civil rights. And in the statement that his critics pounced on for its audacity, King argued that a people that abhorred violence in their own nation had allowed their government to become, quote, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. King did not make this charge lightly, but out of concern for the wellspring of moral authority from which the civil rights movement, his movement, had come. Now it should be incandescently clear, King observed, that no one who had any concern for the integrity and life of America today can ignore the present war. If America's soul becomes totally poisoned, part of the autopsy must read Vietnam. It can never be saved so long as it destroys the deepest hopes of men the world over. 
This is an image of King uh, in Arlington Cemetery leading uh, a protest uh, through it. They were not allowed to stop, so they just marched through it. And he's with uh, a number of, of religious leaders. Uh, this is Newhouse, the guy I spoke about earlier today to some, some of the students. For King, the Vietnam War threatened the American cosmology in a way similar to how Lincoln saw the Civil War as blasphemy. And whereas, Lincoln, or whereas Niebuhr found in Lincoln a way to bring perspective to a war America had to fight, King used Lincoln to denounce a war that placed the nation in moral jeopardy. King acted as a, a rebel prophet, emphasizing the religious understanding many Americans had of their nation to provoke an obligation to stop the war in Vietnam. Of course, unlike Niebuhr and King, Lincoln's critique of civil religion became apparent at the end of a war. Both Niebuhr and King evidently feared what awaited their nation and thought it better to employ Lincoln's example while their wars dragged on. For King, though, the nation had a choice to make. Win the war and lose its soul, or lose the war and save its soul. While he recognized that such a choice sounded cruel, King at least also still believed America had a soul worthy to save. Stanley Hauerwas does not. <laughs> and I don't mean to suggest that Hauerwas is anti-American or unpatriotic, only that his critique of civil religion, his relationship to Lincoln's bequest, entails a rejection of both. And so to conclude, I want to demonstrate one of the most important tasks of an intellectual historian, to consider those who, tr who reject a tradition as well as those who further it. Well, there have been many who have denounced and rejected the ideas of religion in general. Few have done this amidst such a hyper-patriotic moment as Harawas did in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. Harawas is a self-described pacifist in the Anabaptist tradition, meaning that on principle, he has a strained relationship with the United States as a nation. He entitled one of his most important books from 1989, Resident Aliens, to describe the position Christians should take in any nation that commands their allegiance. To say that Hauerwas has an even more strained relationship with civil religion would be far too mild. Yet like Lincoln, Niebuhr, and King, he too has come to his position because of his experience with war. Hauerwas, <clears throat> in a fitting touch of irony, was named by Time Magazine America's best theologian. This is a picture from the issue in the issue that was on newsstands when 9-11 happened. So the guy that is least likely to accept the idea that he's best theologian of anything, much less his nation's best theologian, was sort of ordained that by America's most popular news weekly, Time Magazine. Shortly after the terrorist attacks of 9-11, the editors of the conservative religious journal First Things wrote an editorial entitled Religion in a Time of War to clarify the obligations they believed religious Americans had to the nation. In direct response to the journal, on which he served as a member of its editorial board, Harawas wrote, I fear the we in a time of war is the American we. Indeed, according to Harawas, the issue was whether 9-11 and the war that followed had turned everyone into one-dimensional Americans. To this notion, Harawas expressed his utter frustration. And he has this great Texas drawl, which I cannot do, but he's a really funny guy to listen to. I simply cannot comprehend the editor's celebration of the new Patriot vision, occasioned by September 11th. Simply cannot comprehend. He's also very sort of hyperbolic. It's great stuff. Harawas did not believe patriotism had much to do with the question of war. At least it should not be an issue if one was a Christian. Thus, as a Christian who lived in the United States, Harawas did not believe that his passport determined how he expressed his faith. In short, for Hauerwas, the nature and destiny of America were irrelevant to the truth of Christ crucified. Hauerwas, Hauerwas's response echoed pacifists from earlier wars, specifically Dorothy Day's brave stance in World War II and A.J. Musty's in the early Cold War. Yet Hauerwas was also responding to the civil religion that had developed since 1945. It was the civil religion that Niebuhr attempted to critique with his ironic stance and that King had denounced as woefully misguided and misapplied in the Vietnam War. To Hauerwas, such experiences mattered, not as a tradition to continue, however, but one to abandon. 
He argued that war was not merely a moral catastrophe, that, but had given rise to an alternative faith, an American civil religion that effectively neutralized the Christian church's response to war. While he rejected civil religion as, not, as unnecessary, Americans, he said, had plenty of faiths to choose from. They didn't need civil religion. He observed what a horror would be if the nation is morally renewed by war. Surely a nation capable of fighting a just war must be one that does not need to find its moral substance through war. Through his argument, Harawas raised a question that had haunted Americans at least since Lincoln. He said, is the American response to September 11th a confirmation of Hegel's suggestion that bourgeois states periodically need to be renewed through war? Harawas understood this well and reflected on his, need, on his need to change how he behaved in public. After the attacks and the national transformation, Harawas stopped singing the Star Spangled Banner. He stood when it was played at baseball games, but would not sing. A small thing that reminds me, he explained, that my first loyalty is not to the United States, but to a God and God's church. Harawas' response reflected the combination of elements that cut across the debate over war and nation in America since 1945. As a child growing up in Texas, Harawas had a working class father who had physically embodied the American dream. Then Vietnam came, and Harawas recalled, while he and his colleagues were critical of the war, they did not think that our position made them other than American. Indeed, he wrote, the criticism of the war, criticisms of the war were based on an appeal to America's highest ideals. In the aftermath of 9-11, Harawas said, rather uh, tragically in some ways, I do not even share their allegiance to American ideals. Where does that leave me, he asked. Do I forsake all forms of patriotism, failing to acknowledge that we as a people are better off because of the sacrifices that were made in World War II? To this, I can only answer yes. If you call patriotism natural, I certainly do disavow that connection. Did that make him ungrateful for being an American? Harold Loss took care to explain that he was not anti-American. Rather, he rejected patriotism not because it was a popular position to take up, but because it was the only position that seemed legitimate. In a time of war, Howard Loss saw clearly the pull civil religion could have not merely on Americans, but on all those who, by the very nature of what else they believed in, had to have options for faith. Indeed, Harawas said, I fear the absence of a counter community to challenge America. Bin Laden has given Americans what they so desperately need, a war without end. Unlike other critics of American foreign policy and war, who saw George W. Bush simply expanding the paradigm of American exceptionalism, Harawas understood that the significance of war for the United States was in the understanding Americans had of their own nation. As had been seen in the Vietnam War, Americans could turn against the actions of the nation but they found it more difficult to imagine a position with enough distance to be truly critical of the nation. That was why following Vietnam, there emerged a rededication to civil religion as a way to salvage what, 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 had, what had always been the last hope, not for the world, but at least for Americans. For Harawas, 9-11 sparked another episode of war in a period since World War II that has consistently found moral sustenance in wars. He says, war names the time we send the youth to kill and die. In an effort to assure ourselves the lives we lead are worthy of such sacrifices. War makes clear we must believe in something, even if we are not sure what that something is, except that it has something to do with the American way of life. So you might wonder where I stand on the existence and persistence, or even the benefit of civil religion. Uh, Stan, Stanley Hamilton and I have gone back and forth on this quite a few times. And as I argued in the conclusion uh, of my book on civil religion, I find it, I find civil religion one of the few ways that Americans debate the morality of the most crucial collective experience they have, fighting a war. It might also be one of the best ways to make sense of the dynamics of public religion, while being, no doubt, one of the worst ways to worship God. In the end, when I consider what happens to America in a time of war, I conclude that Lincoln's bequest continues to make sense, primarily because he wrestled with the imperatives of his moment 
while he labored under the burden of history. Civil religion reveals both why we fight and die and what we do not fight and die 